And welcome to the Inland Sports Show, everybody. Usually about 6.05 first pitch, but Twitter had other ideas. But we beat Twitter. We got live on the air anyways. And again, you can watch the Inland Sports Show 6 p.m. on Twitter, 8 p.m. on the Inland Sports YouTube channel, and they will live forever on both those social media platforms. My name is Pep Fernandez. We appreciate you tuning in. So much stuff happening. So much new news coming out as well. Uh, we're going to talk what it means for the high school landscape. Uh, we just heard from the Western Athletic Conference, the WAC, which uh, California Baptist is part of the WAC. They are pushing back their fall sports season just by a couple of weeks. So I guess that's kind of some good news in there. The fact that they are still going ahead with fall sports but they're going to push it back just by a couple of weeks for uh, the beginning of their competition. As for the CIF, we heard that the CIF state office will come out Monday morning with a statement, and then the CIF southern section will come out on Monday at 1 p.m. with a press conference from the commissioner, Rob Wygod, to discuss what the fall sports calendar will look like. But until then... We can still hope. We can keep our fingers crossed. We want high school football so bad. Join us here live on the Inland Sports Show. He is the head coach of the Riverside Poly Bears, one of our dear, dear friends here on the show. It's the great John Rice. And coach, I mean, we, we want high school football, and I think we'll get high school football. But the question is, when will we get high school football? It looks like January, but do you have a hunch? Are you? Do you have any predictions you'd like to make before we get the official announcement? Well, at first, we've got to have a disclaimer. Thanks for having me on. Um, the first thing I need to say is it has to be about safety for, for, for coaches. It has to be about safety for players, for fans. And so having said that, it is a virtual impossibility that we can play uh, as scheduled, obviously, because our first scrimmage was scheduled on August 28th. So there's no way that we could start now. Um, the other possibility was the model everybody was talking about that was maybe pushing the season back in, into October, late September, October. And then, of course, the one that everybody's talking about uh, is January. So um, if I had to guess to be safe, uh, it would be January again. But um, we'll do whatever they come out. We'll be we'll be ready to go. The problem, I think, if you went in October, you'd have to consider what would happen if the, the COVID cases were were not down. And if you start too early, then you may have to cancel everything. So I'm not a prognosticator. I'm going to wait. And we've been preparing our kids. And whenever they give us the plan and they tell us when the season starts, a lot of coaches are going to be backward planning immediately on their preparation. That's the one thing we just need is a date. Well, I should have brought in Jeff Gorham in the beginning. I apologize, Jeff. I got too excited talking high school football. But my co-host, Jeff, live from the beaches of Hawaii as well. How are you, Jeff? I'm hanging in there. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm every single week I'm in a different place. As you know, I'm social distancing. There's no one at the beach here, just me hanging out. <laughs> well, you know, Jeff and I, you know, we both love high school football, Coach, and, and we want to see it happen, but we want, it to, we want to see it happen safely. And if, if you just kind of gauge the landscape of what, you know, other states are doing with high school football, what colleges are doing, um, and even just junior colleges here in the state of California, it, it, it looks like the, the high school sports calendar would begin 
in January. So my, my question for you would be, you know, between now and January, that's still, if you can make me do some math real quick, was that five months? Six, you know, five, the better part of five months still to go. I mean, how, how can you stay connected with your coaching staff, with your team? Are there certain things maybe you think you could do to get ready for a season? Is that for me or Jeff? For, for you, Coach Rice, because I'm just okay. curious. I mean, yeah. you know, yep. I know there's a couple teams out there, and we've had some coaches on the show that, mm-hmm. you know, they did some summer workout stuff. They started ramping up thinking, okay, just in case, mm-hmm. if we go August 21st, week zero, we, we want to make sure we're kind of ready, doing something to be ready. Now, I know we have not seen what a CIF calendar would look like, but for the mm-hmm. sake of this conversation, let's say it starts in January – are there certain things that you feel like you might be able to do as a team in the next several months to maybe get ready for January games? I think absolutely, and that's a great question, and, and we have a plan for each. And we were talking earlier before with Jeffrey, and I think it depends on what your district allows, what your school board says is going to happen, because there are some districts in the IE have said we're going to go all virtual. Their districts decided that's what's best for their stakeholders. The next question would be, what are they going to do or allow? Uh, are they going to allow workouts for other sports teams? For instance, LA Unified said we're closing down and sports teams will not be allowed on campus. Having said that, are all the schools in the IE that decide virtual, you know, are they going to allow teams to practice according to, to the national guidelines and county health guidelines by Dr. Kaiser? And the second issue that plays into that is, is your school district going to go hybrid? There, Albert's going to go hybrid. Um, our USD is going to have a board meeting on the 21st. One of the options is a hybrid model. So where this ties in and the, and the big difference I see is if a school goes hybrid, if a district votes to go hybrid and your coach is fortunate enough to have your sports PE and have those kids in PE and you can use social distancing as part of that in-person model, you can still be with your kids on the field practicing safe distancing and coach your kids from – August until December, which would be huge. Uh, I would love to see that and be careful, but we would be able to work with our kids. Whereas a district who has a virtual lockdown and for their reasons say, nope, we want to be safe. There are no teams allowed. And the season in January, that's a huge disparity. So that that could exist. Um, we're we're going to go along and have a plan for each. If we, if we ended up virtual with a lockdown, you continually give the kids, you stay in communication with them. We, we're on GroupMe and Google Classroom and we meet with our kids. We do virtual instructions, uh, chalk talks, video review, uh, and then we suggest workouts to go. Uh, they do individually. But um, I don't know if it's going to be an even playing field and it's not going to be anybody's fault. In, in life, things happen. And I think our, our motto in our program has been since last year is adapt and overcome and you be ready to go. So whatever they tell us to do, we're going to do it to the best of our ability. I just hope that um, not too many people are put at a disadvantage. Yeah, you know, my, my biggest concern is, and just like you, Coach Coach Rice, is some of these school districts like Orange County said they're going back full bore uh, five days a week, regular school. Um, it does make put you guys at a different disadvantage because these guys, these high schools are going to be practicing every single day. Um, they're going to be in great shape come you know january if they're in school every single day we're, we're not just talking about the private schools the, you know the, the the trinity league they could play their own their own league and, and kind of if they wanted to and play a whole full season but orange county is elected to go full-time uh with students in classrooms you know i i all think that when, when mr why god rob why god makes an announcement that they're going to have to abide by that. And I think I know people saw the state, uh, the state sent out state say I've sent out a questionnaire to the districts. It was, uh, it was on Twitter and I confirmed with my AD, Mr. Vaughn, that it was sent out and there, we were waiting on direction from our board, our school board. But I think they're going to look he's taking this time to look at the best information he has on how many schools would be able to go and then make us make a decision on when everybody could play. Obviously nobody in LA County can play until for the foreseeable uh, future. So even though if the privates are ready and go five days a week, if the CIF doesn't sanction their games or their season, they would have to wait as well is how I understand it. Well, coach, I think where it could get met, could get messy is um, 
I was talking to someone earlier today, and let's take the the Citrus Belt League for example. And I I think your your Inland Valley League could be in a similar boat where you have schools from multiple different school districts in the same league. And we were talking about the CBL. You've got you've got Beaumont, you've got Ukaipa, you've got Redlands, and you got Cajon. Those are all separate school districts. You know what? Like you were pointing out, what if San Bernardino says, okay, we're doing all distance learning. And let's say Ukaipa and Beaumont come out and say, no, we're going to do a hybrid. We're going to bring the kids on campus for a little bit. Football coaches can work them out a little bit. That's where I think it kind of gets a little bit messy because here we're trying to have like a, a level playing field and it's not going to be even inside your, your small little leagues. It, it, you could have varying different types of schooling when we return, whether it's in person or not in person. I, I agree 100%. And uh, there's another issue, I think, that this goes into, and it's, it's physical preparation and safety. If some of these schools, I think you have to consider if you're overseeing any planning, what happens to the kids from the districts that cannot, they're locked out. If that happens, they need enough time to make sure that they are properly conditioned so that there's a minimization of, of uh, injury. And then you're talking about two and three sport athletes that their bodies are going to be, you know, they need to be in top shape and the coaches need to be cognizant of that when they're sharing athletes. I mean, poor kids, you don't want them to have to choose two or between one of the sports and the coaches need to work with each other. I'm going to be very flexible if I get a request from another coach to, Hey, we're having a workout in the fall. I know, I know we're not in season and the basketball coach calls and says, Hey, we have a few kids we're sharing. Would you mind if they come with us, you know, for our workouts? I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that our kids uh, get the best opportunity in the in the spring to play and be safe and and um, maximize their opportunities. Yeah, I I'm going to piggyback off of that concept right there, Coach. And if you do have a a, a season where you have basketball, football, uh, playing at the same time, which could possibly happen, a lot of high schools, the bigger high schools don't suffer, but the smaller high schools will because they do share athletes. You know, you might have a varsity basketball team. Uh, but you might not have a JV or freshman team, and it might as well go for football as well because the shared athletes, they're going to have to make a decision, and it, it's its really not fair um, because, like you said, some of these schools aren't going to be able to field teams because of the shared athletes. I just think it makes it hard, and, and I don't know how the CIF can address that, but you are going to have some schools that won't be able to field teams. Pep, maybe you can, you can answer this question, but – one of the plans that the coaches are talking about, they've heard about is, you know, a shortened season playing maybe five games, only league games and playoffs, eliminating the state playoffs. So uh, they, the, the spring, the fall sports uh, would start. And when they're done, then the basketball and the winter sports would play. And then when they're done, the spring sports would play. So there wouldn't be any crossover of seasons. And that, and um, that's the way that I think they could help not have conflicting sports, basketball and football playing at the same time, because those kids have to make those choices anyway, if they're in a fall sport, but that would require, you only have, you know, 18 weeks in the, in the fall semester. So I think if they did it like that and reduced the season, they could fit all those sports in, in a shortened way. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's one of the plans on the table is the fact that um, like you said, it would be a condensed season and maybe football is January to March and basketball is going to be like March to May and baseball season could be like May and all the way through the month of June or something like that where there's not going to, I mean, there's always, even right now, like a normal school year, there is a little bit of crossover, um, you know, like in November from, from football to basketball, there's a little bit of crossover and I think we would still have that. Um, but I kind of look, Coach, I kind of look at even the community college model because I'm sure the CIF has taken a look at what the junior colleges um, are doing as well. And I know it's a little bit different because a, a junior college football player wouldn't, wouldn't typically be playing, let's say, basketball or, or wrestling or something like that. They would be, you know, individualized, you know, specializing in, in that one sport. But at least when you look at the community college level, you know, they, they've kind of staggered it. it. Even though everything is considered spring, they've kind of staggered it to football's really a winter sport. I know they're calling it spring, but if you actually look at football um, for junior colleges, it's the months of January, February, March, and a little bit into April. So it's, it's basically like a winter sport. And I think for high school football, even though we might say it's spring, 
I think technically it's, it's going to be more of like a winter sport, and then basketball would be more of a spring sport. I don't know. I'm probably making this confusing the way they're going to possibly stagger this. And you're right, in condensed seasons too, like even the junior colleges, I, I was talking to Coach Elgatis cause at SBVC because I was trying to make sense of all this, and he said that the maximum they would play, the maximum amount of games they would play is nine. Seven regular season games and two postseason games, but no state championship. So the the you'd win like a Southern California title, like a regional title, but um, so seven regular season games, a postseason game or two, and then and then that's it. And I think I think the CIF could have a similar looking model when it comes down to it. No state playoffs, at least. You know, I think we would be blessed to just stay safe, keep the kids healthy and, and play when we get the science right. And we get the go ahead from the state and the county health officers. Um, just think about the kids who didn't get to play last spring, just the seniors and all the athletes who didn't get to play at all. I would just hate to have that happen again. So I, I really go by the philosophy and try to live my life. The glass is half full. I mean, we're, we're going to be blessed really to play. And I think I've talked to some coaches, and, and I know this is true on our staff, having contact with our staff and our players the last uh, the last four months, we just have an appreciation. It's a shared appreciation that we don't take it for granted anymore. And we're going to pack in, you know, a lot of experience and, and life is short. So I think it'll mean more to a lot of people, educators, players, parents, that we're going to make the most of it. Whatever comes our way, we're going to have a positive attitude. We're going to follow district guidelines and mandates, make it safe, and um, and, and give those kids the experience they deserve. And if it means we play less of a season, then, then so be it. Well, Coach, I know California is a is a whole different deal, you know, compared to you know the rest of the United States. But I kind of look at some of the other states, some of the other states have already come out and started making decisions. And I, I wish I would have took notes because I, I just see, I think it was New Mexico who said no football um, this calendar year, maybe, you know, like in, in the spring wow. of 2021, um, if, if I've got that right. And there's some other states um, that said, no, we, we are going to push forward with fall, but we're going to start a little bit later and we're going to play less games. Do, do you look at what other states are kind of doing, you know, knowing that California is a little bit different than the rest? Well, the coaches, you know, uh, at Twitter Universe, there's a lot of friendships from coaches across the country sharing what they, they're doing with each other. Um, and there are some some states where they've decided to go ahead and play, and there's some that aren't. Um, in the end, you know, unfortunately, politics are going to have some things to do with that, about the attitude of the safety. And so um, if if they said no sports, I'm sure they would have a reason for that. Um, that's way above my pay grade again. And I don't mean to beg off the question, but we'll, we'll be ready to go. I do think there's some issues that they should really think about for the kids who, who need sports, who, who, for many reasons, but the kids that may, uh, be able to get scholarships, that is an issue. The kids shouldn't, they shouldn't be taken away from them. And of course there's some, there's some consequences for that. There'll be kids flying around if their parents really think that they can, serve their kids and move and uproot and move across state lines or uh, cities or sections, even they'll do it. Yeah. Um, now think about. Well, it looks like we uh, got coach a little frozen over there. Jeff, are you still there as well? I am. I'm just basking in the sun out here. Just working <laughs> the pan. Yeah. I think, uh, I think coaches, I think coaches uh, zoom. Let's see if he's still there. Oh, no, I, think he's still, I, think, I think he's still frozen there. He was froze. He got cut off. But what I wanted to piggyback off off what he was saying is that, and Jeff, as an educator, you know this as well too. Like, you can make a case that it's it's more important to do distance learning and be safe, but you could also make a case that a lot of pediatricians are recommending that hey, kids need to be in school. They need to be back in the classroom. Um, they, for the most part, you can tell that um, they have been resistant from the coronavirus. Not all, but I, I would say um, a general, a general, you know, generalization is a, the, the younger population is doing better with the virus, obviously, than, than the younger population. So, I mean, I see it both ways. I get it because we're, we're not all in the same boat. Like, for, for example, my family, you know, none of us 
have had the coronavirus. Um, none of our family members have. We don't have underlying health conditions. So if, if you're a family and you have a, a son or daughter who has a health condition, or maybe you've got like a, an 80 year old grandma that lives in your house with you, I mean, that's different. Like we're not all in the same boat. Like I totally get it. So we're, we're coming from different perspectives, but I kind of see it both ways. I mean, you know, I'm going to throw my kids in the classroom if, if I get the opportunity. And I know there's some parents that, you know, because of their own set of circumstances feel like, hey, I, I don't want them there. You know, maybe, again, they have some other underlying medical conditions or maybe they have someone um, that's a more, more vulnerable, you know, age, you know, they're a little elderly. I, I don't know. Yeah, for, for me, I mean, I have, similar, I have a three-year-old, seven-year-old and a 14-year-old. My three-year-old, if, if he doesn't go back, I mean, he's going to preschool. He'll be four uh, next week, but he's going to preschool. I just want him around other kids because he's, he's you know, going to be four, and it'll be almost a year since he has even seen another four-year-old, uh, which is going to be hard. I mean, he's been four months, and he's just seen me and, and his mom and his brothers. Uh, my older boy who's going to be a freshman. I, I want him to go to school. I want my seven-year-old who's going to be a second grader. Heck, I, I just want him there, and if – if it's safe for them, it's great. I worry about the teachers, but I want to go back. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm, I'll be the first one to sign up and say I'll go back full time, just because I'm a, you know, I'm an educator. I want to be around kids. That's why I became an educator. Uh, that's part of the deal. If I get sick, I hope I don't uh, spread it to my family. And if mm -hmm. if I do, you know, that's on me. But I, I miss I miss the high school kids. I miss uh, being around them, and, and I hope we can be with them soon. You know, Pep, that's a great and Jeff, that's a great point because I have a, a I have a junior and she was uh, the consensus among her friends were that they had exceptional teachers in the spring that that did the best they could for AP classes. But they were all of the opinion mo or most of them that it was very difficult to get the same kind of education and advanced classes online. Um, yeah. So they, she was really hoping and her friends were really hoping to have some kind of hybrid option so they could at least be with their teachers um, some of those days. But on the other hand, think about the working parents. And my heart goes out to those yeah. families who have two working parents. And if they have a full they have a full five day a week and they're able to do that, then life is normal. If they have a virtual, all virtual, they have an issue. But they might be able to get daycare. What happens to the hybrid model? Uh, and especially with and I'm not talking about a 13, 14 year old who may be able to be a lock, uh, you know, a latchkey kid, but the elementary school kids five, six, seven, eight years old when they have two working parents and you go to school two days. What about those other three days? I just think that's a heavy, heavy burden. And my heart goes out to those parents who are doing everything they can uh, to work. And financially, what a burden and what a choice for those parents. I mean, they can't afford to, to change and say, I want to take my kid to private school. You know, there are a lot of the private schools are staying open. But a lot, the fact is, a lot of people don't have those kind of resources. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm being honest. I have my mother-in-law watches watches our uh, our boys, and my parents and my my parents are in their 80s. My mother-in-law's in her late 70s. You know, I, I don't want to put my, my my family or my mother-in-law or my parents at risk. It might end up being a, a, a choice that one of us, my wife or I, stay home and and take care of our kids just because they come first. It's hard. It's very hard. And I can I couldn't yeah. imagine being. Uh, uh, strapped and, and hungry uh, and trying to uh, stay home just to take care of my kids. I can't work. Well, guys, on Monday, we'll we'll get some guidance, at least from the CIF, of, of mm -hmm. what this is going to look like in terms of sports. And uh, I'm just kind of wondering if, if all of these decisions by school districts in terms of how they're going to do classes in the fall is going to you know, maybe dictate what their decision is going to be. Maybe they have not decided. Maybe they're waiting to see what the school districts are doing. Um, but yeah, I would say a majority going distance learning and just a handful of, you know, schools, public schools, I should say, public schools going to, um, you know, the maybe a hybrid or in-person learning. So coach, I always appreciate the time. You're one of the best. Thanks for being so candid with us. And I, yes. I you know, we're just speculating here because we really don't know what's yeah. going on, but we'll get, we'll get some guidance at least uh, come Monday from the CIF office. We, we will. And I just want to, the last thing I want to say is we have uh, the coaches. We're in the profession and we love kids. We will adapt and we will do what's best for kids. We just want to make sure that the kids are safe, that they have the opportunity to thrive 
and um, learn how to adapt and overcome in, in, in a tough situation. So I think the coaches are going to be a model for kids of how we react because life's going to happen. Um, we don't know how long this is going on, and God forbid the situation is not over in January. I don't even want to think about that, and I'm just hoping for the best. Yeah, me too, because I, I thought at, at one point, I'm like, well, it definitely won't be around when we start this next school year, and, and here we are, um, middle of July, and we're talking about you know, the same things that we were talking about in March, you know, are kids going to be in class or what about sports? And so yeah, I hope, hopefully, hopefully things are going to be clearing up um, very, very soon. John Rice, the head football coach at Riverside Poly High School. Coach, always appreciate it. Good seeing you too. Good to see you too. Good to see you, Jeff. Good to see you, coach. The Stay back back the easy. Best. All right. We're going to take a quick break when we come back. Uh, he is the new head basketball coach at UC Riverside, the great Mike Magpie. We'll be right back on the Inland Sports Show. Welcome back to the Mike's Fitness Equipment Studio. It's the Inland Sports Show. The Inland Sports Show is brought to you by Spoiled. Quick quality oil change. Spoil yourself and your car at Spoiled. Ken Sporting Goods. They have all of your sporting gear needs, letterman's jackets, and team uniforms. Boost performance training with Coach Ray Bass. Athletes of all levels and all sports are going to boost performance training in Corona. Mike's Fitness Equipment. Check out the new storeroom on La Cadena. Quality fitness equipment at affordable prices. Mike's Fitness Equipment. And JoJo's Gorilla Dog, located in the Mountain Grove Shopping Center in Redlands. Let's be frank, not all dogs are created equal. JoJo's Gorilla Dog. I'm busy, I got things to do, but I really need an oil change. I just need something fast and affordable. Well, I'm right off the 91 in Arlington. Let's go check out Spoiled. And they even got a 10 minute oil change special. I love it. Up, Take it up. Lights reset on day one. Okay, looks like you're all set. Have a good one. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Spoiled quick quality oil change right off the 91 freeway at Arlington.
overtime program is really where it all started. So um, it's a complete off-season program where we do uh, strength training, speed training, we do nutrition prepping. Uh, we offer our athletes supplements at the end. Um, it has everything you need. We track progress, we track their weights, we do uh, performance testing. It's really a, uh, a everything you need to prepare for your upcoming season. It's a great program. We've had a lot of great athletes get involved in it. And uh, we're going to be rolling out again this January. This is the most important part of, uh, of the off season. You know, if you really need to get better, if you need to really need to improve, you got to put the time in. And I mean, to get stronger, to get faster, it takes time. Well, you can definitely visit our website at www.boosttrainingsystems.com. Uh, you can come check us out at uh, 500 Harrington Street, Suite C1. Uh, check out the Boost Performance Center. Um, or you can contact us directly at 951-532-3903. Just send us a text. Welcome back to the Mike's Fitness Equipment Studio. It's the Inland Sports Show. Hey, what's up, everybody? Don't forget, there's two spoiled locations now. I'm at the brand new one right off the 91 freeway at Arlington. You can spoil yourself. You can spoil your car. You come in here, 10 minutes, you're in and you're out. You're back on the road. Go check out Spoiled, local business, locally owned and operated. And they've got the location off the 215 freeway at Alessandro. And this one, the brand new one here, half of uh, the 91 at Arlington. I felt spoiled. It was great. I got in easy. I mean, the price was the best. The price is just helped me out. And, and what I really enjoyed about it is that they explained to me what was going on today. And I feel like when I walked out of here, I just felt, felt so special. I said I had a new boyfriend. His name is Foyle. <laughs> and you got your flowers. And I got yeah. your flowers. <laughs> And welcome back to the Inland Sports Show. Big thanks to John Rice, the head football coach at Riverside Poly High School, as we wait until Monday to get some direction on what the upcoming high school sports calendar will look like. Will we have football in the fall? Will it be January? A lot of answers um, coming our way in just a couple of days. But right now, the big news, rocking Riverside, and he's joining us live on the show. Jim Alexander beat us to it. He got the first interview, but we got the next one. <laughs> it's our good friend Mike Magpio, the head men's basketball coach at uc riverside coach first off how does that sound when you hear when that you, when you say it like that pep it sounds it sounds even better and i don't know, <laughs> I don't know if i've been introduced yet like that so it feels great man i'm excited it's it's an honor i'm humbled all of it but i'm just i, I am fired up about it well, well coach you know I, i've been i've been with you the last two years virtually you know i've been to every game except a couple that i was traveling but uh i want to say this you, your road to being a head basketball coach at a Division One level, uh, first being the first – is it the first Asian-American that's ever been a Division One head coach? I, I mean, that's what they're saying. Uh, I, I know Filipino for sure, but I'm doing some studies. I think there was some uh, – there might have been somebody else in 1940s. I'm not sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just been... take – we'll say the modern era. How about that? That's safe. <laughs> but but my, my question to you is, you know, you, you this was uh, – this pathway to being a head basketball coach it really was a different pathway. You started off as a realtor and you've been, you've been basically all over the country under some great programs and great mentors. Can you tell us just in a, in a nutshell of your history, besides the fact that you were uh, an outstanding realtor and had a real estate company, what made you change that and to get into coaching and where you've been? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, we'll call it. I was, I was running a real estate mortgage company, you know, during the boom. So I feel like, a lot of people could have done that. I'm sure you guys might have might have dipped your toe in that in that business world for a little bit. Um, I was on the radio though a lot, which was gross. Uh, I'd never want to hear that. I hope nobody <laughs> finds those finds those 60 second ads. It was on Mason and Ireland. It was so bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just you know it was something I've always dreamt about. I was coaching high school basketball, and I've always watched, and I just dreamt about it. I'd always see these guys, Brad Stevens, and or even the NBA Eric Spolstra, or. Coach Calipari, whoever it was, and I just was like, I can do that. I know, I think I can do that. And 
um, you know, Jim Alexander really did a great, like, can you make, what, what detail he put in, into the, to the article. I mean, it was really, that as it happened, I wrote a letter and Kyle Smith, who's, you know, I w- ended up working for, for four years at Columbia and a year at San Francisco. And he's the connection to David Patrick. He responded, you know, when he said, meet me at a diner on the Upper West Side. And I did. And, you know, the, the long story short, he ended up hiring me after volunteering for him for a couple months. Um, so it's been a journey, but you know, what's crazy is what I, I just actually met with our seniors literally 10 minutes ago. And I told them, you know, you never know, like you're going through this crazy time, um, this last three, four months, and you don't know how this is going to equip you in the future. And I, from experience, I can tell you like all those experiences that we're talking about, even his first two weeks as head coach, you know, I'm, I'm equipped, I'm prepared for it. You know, I've had experience as a CEO and managing people. Um, and then I've coached for a long time. I started coaching when I was you know, 19 years old while I was in college. It was, even if it was eighth grade boys, I've been coaching. So it's, uh, I, I'm been prepared. I haven't coached a game yet. I, I, I pray that we do. You know, I want that more than anything in the world. I want to run a practice. I keep down Tamika and Wes. I'm like, you know what I'm, what I really love to do what I think I'm pretty good at is coaching. Like I can do all <laughs> presentations and everything, but I'm good at coaching. You know, that's what I love to do. And that's the joke with all my coaching friends. They're like, ah, Mike Magpie loves coaching, loves coaching. And I do, you know, I love it. Well, coach, I wanted to ask you, you know, Jeff brought up the great point about your, your backstory about real estate. It, you know, and you said something that really caught my attention was, you know, managing people. Like, I think people, you know, look at maybe like Phil Jackson. He was a great, you know, he could identify with so many different kinds of walks of life and he just got, he could relate to people. So when you, when you took it, your, your real estate background and apply it to basketball, are there, there's gotta be some similarities, right? It's exactly the same. I really do. I mean, you know, it was really a big, at the time we did real estate, but it was mainly a mortgage company. It was during the boom, you know, 03, 04, 05, 06, I was rolling. I was driving a Range Rover. We were killing it in Southern California, <laughs> a big house. And um, that's the joke, but it was managing a sales staff. You know, my, my, that was my job. I had a business partner um, who, who was great at negotiation, but I managed the sales staff. I trained the sales staff and kind of managed the company. That was kind of my role. So it was just the same thing. It's just trying to lead and motivate, encourage, um, same ideas i'll coach like don't embarrass anybody in 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 public but if i'm going to get on somebody bring them in private you know it's all these things translate to coaching so really i think that's what i love more about it wasn't the real estate that i loved it was it was leading and managing and so i think the one thing that's just like seamless for me is like even though i got some little firecrackers on our staff and, and lezak and 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 wheezy um they're not they're fancy staff <laughs> Yeah, you know, Jeff knows. Jeff might join our staff soon. <laughs> I don't know if I can deal with three of them. Uh, but, but you know, managing a staff, I think, comes natural just because I've had experience in doing it and working together and collaborating, like, with Tamika and Wes and, and um, the administration. That'll come natural to me, you know. So I hope so, knock on wood. Well, Coach, you know, we're talking about your staff. And, you know, you work for uh, David Patrick, who – you know, I honestly have been around him for the last two years, been around you, been around everybody in that staff. You guys are really leaders of men. And I want to say that the men that you brought in, and these are the student athletes, they're all good guys. I mean, there isn't, uh, there isn't one I sit off the air. There isn't one that I wouldn't bring home to my I, – I would always bring them to my house because you guys have brought in great, great individuals. And I think that's a, res, a, a reflection of Coach David Patrick uh, and yourself, now the head coach, those are the kind of guys you want on your staff because they, you have you and your assistants have brought in those players, and they're all great young men. Well, DP, even when he first like interviewed me, and I was in San Francisco, and it's funny, like Kyle was like, "What are you doing?" And I, was, I think I was like taking a nap. He called me. He's like, "David Patrick wants to talk to you." I was like, "What are you doing? Like you napping?" I was like, "Yeah, coach, I'm just napping. Like whatever. We just had left practice on a Saturday, Sunday, and he's like, you, you better get ready, David. Pat- Nobody works harder than David Patrick. You're not gonna, oh, you're not, not gonna make it with DP. You're not gonna make it." And then, Kyle was saying that, and, but when I first interviewed with DP, like the first thing he told me is like, you know, I just really want good people. And he say this, he'd say this to um, to the recruits and the student athletes as well. I want people that can watch my kids. That's really what Coach would always say. And uh, you know, obviously, I owe everything to DP. This has been set up, you know, beautifully by DP. I'm fortunate if we get to play games. I'm inheriting a group that's just just high character like just a high character group, forget about the, that we have pretty good size and talent and all that stuff, just great kids. 
you know, so I got no qualms there with that. And then the staff is just it is remaining intact, fully committed. So it should be seamless transition, but all because of coach. And that's what I've learned from coach. You know, it's just I don't care if you can bring a player. I don't care. You know, that's DP. He always said, I, all I care about is your good people. Obviously, you got to be competent and be, be a good coach. But, like, I just care if you're a good person. And so that's what we got in this program. We got 20 of those staff and players, just good, good men. Coach, what are some other things that you learned from Coach Patrick? Observing how he, I don't know, handles his business in the middle of a game, the what his preparation, um, you know, just maybe his policies when the team travels to, to different schools, you know, on, on a plane, on a bus. I, what are, just, are there just things that you picked up along the way, maybe simply just by observing the way he handled himself? I mean, if I could put DP, like, inside of my body, like, his, I would just love to be, like, <laughs> he's so poised, so calm, you know. I mean, of course, during games, you guys might see him more during games, but he is just such a, first of all, great person. That really, really, really is what stands out about DP. That's what I've learned the most. Like, you may not get along with everybody. You may not believe in everybody's, like, methods or whatnot, whether it's people you work with or other opponents or whatnot, but DP will never, ever show that to you. You know, like, he, he, he DP's he, he's pretty smooth, man. He's pretty smooth. I'll never be as cool as him. I got that from a couple high school coaches. It's just like in recruiting this this week. They're like, "Ah, man, you you you, you know, don't ever try to be as cool of them. Be as yourself, be yourself." And I'm like, "What does that mean?" But that's just absolutely true. I'll never be as cool cool as them. Um, as far as like the way he handles a team, like you know, I've had different different coaches, you know, mentors or whatnot. Kyle's one way, you know, and DP. It's perfect. It's a perfect. It's a perfect like a hybrid of who I'd like to be. You know, Kyle's about accountability, accountability, accountability. DP has that as well, but he's able to communicate it in a very like just calm, poised way. And he really counts on those relationships that he builds with the guys. So every day he comes in, not that Kyle doesn't, Kyle does the same thing. They're very similar that they touch all the guys, but DP's got his arms around the guys and just, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. So when he told the guys, it was, it was heartbreaking for all of us, you know, and I took over and it was just, I'm in tears and crying. It was just hard to inspire the guys in that moment um, because we all love them so much. So just, those relationships really, really matter. Just learning that. And then as far as like, you know, he's, he's, he does it in a way it's so smooth and cool, but he's, you hold, get, get your hoods off. You know what I mean? Like all of it, like when you're traveling and whatnot, you, you know, Jeff and Pat, you guys have traveled with us. Like he doesn't really give an inch. You would, you know, he's a player's coach who doesn't really give an inch. It's really impressive. Like he's a player's coach who's still as tough as Randy Benton and Kyle Smith and Jamie Dixon, all the guys that he's been around. That's what made him successful is that he still runs a tight program. We do, but at a high performing rate, but he's just cool, calm and collected. It, it, it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can, I can say this. Uh, he went to bat for me more than once. And uh, I will be eternally.